The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, and welcome back if you have been with us yesterday. I'm hoping, again, this is going to be the most exciting hour of the day for you. My name is Stefan, and I have the honor to host three of the most knowledgeable people in this company who will be talking about probably the hottest topic within Salesforce today, which is using commerce, marketing, and service together to create one integrated experience, or more simply, a Salesforce cross-cloud solution. Before I kick this off, what I would like to do is um, uh, just take a few seconds to thank all of you for joining us today and investing time into learning Salesforce. And I know you're taking time out of your busy schedules to watch these series, and I appreciate all of you, you know, being here with us online and watching or watching the recording. We try very hard to make this the best hour in the day for you. So thank you again for being a Salesforce partner, spending time with us today, and your business with Salesforce. Now. Before we dive into the content, let me introduce you to the fantastic speakers for this series today. We have Mehir Panchal, who leads our Salesforce cross-cloud practice, but is also a well-known ambassador to our customers and internal success team. We have Abram Lloyd, long-standing Commerce Cloud veteran and a major thought leader in the company on cross-cloud. We have Derek Ellis, who is the product expert when it comes to marketing Cloud Connect. Sanjay Bansal, who is responsible for global cross-cloud alliances. If you are a Salesforce partner, you most definitely have to get connected with Sanjay as he would scale cross-cloud for partners across the ecosystem. And lastly, myself, my team will get you covered if you're a partner in the EMEA or Latin America region and you're looking for marketing and commerce enablement. And I have to apologize, but I need one more minute before I can hand over to our speaker to cover some of the logistics uh, for this webinar. Uh, this is a series of four webinars. So please make sure you download the calendar file that you find linked within the registration uh, that you get as part of the uh, GoToWebinar registration process. We had some people who had trouble yesterday in, in getting this calendar file imported. The important thing is that um, not all the typical software bits and pieces out there that will support calendar uh, will import that file correctly. What you will see is that if the import has, has worked out for you, and if that import has worked out for you uh, correctly, um, there is a, uh, you will see four calendar invites, and you will, saw, you will see four of those uh, populating um, your, uh, uh, your calendar, in a sense. Now, let me uh, walk you through those four bits and pieces that we're going to cover. So yesterday, we covered delivering integrated B2C experiences. And the recording of this session can be found in partner community in a group that is called the Official Cross-Cloud B2C Expert Groups. And for internal Salesforce employees, have a look at the chat window and go to webinar. This is where you'll find more information as to how to find it. Today, Mihil is going to talk about data strategy. Tomorrow, sorry, tomorrow, next week on April 30, we're going to be looking at uh, the connectors and going to run a deep dive of commerce, so commerce to service, commerce to marketing, marketing cloud connect and solution kits. And on May 2nd, one day after most of us in EMEA have a well-deserved day off on May 1, uh, we're going to talk about customer segmentation, the top challenges, segmentation on the Salesforce platform, customer journey, engagement, and exploring engagement models. So pretty, pretty cool stuff. Now, if you have questions over the course of this webinar, go to webinar has a button that will let you raise a question and we cover all of those questions at the end of this sessions. Now, very, very, one very, very last thing here. Uh, we need to talk about forward looking statements. You can imagine that the speakers on this webinar series are all fired up and want to get you as excited as we are about Salesforce products and capabilities. Now, with that in mind, be conscious that from time to time, we may get carried away just a little bit and use future looking statement or forward looking statements. Do make sure to make buying decisions only on products and capabilities that are available today. And with that, finally, I'm gonna hand over to Mihir Panchal. Mihir, please take it away. Awesome, thank you so much, Stefan. Hello, everyone. Um, so, you know, one of the things that Stefan talked about is we're part of the cross cloud program at Salesforce. So this is actually, um, for those that attended yesterday, I think already know what it is, but for those attending new today, I think it's important to just quickly cover what our mission is, because I think it helps, uh, especially partners like yourselves and, and how we're available to be uh, of support and of service to you guys. Um, the CrossCloud program is really a, a new program that we've started this year. Uh, and really the goal is, we know that 
you know, integrating uh, commerce cloud, marketing cloud, service cloud, et cetera, together uh, requires some effort, thought process, thinking, and, and uh, has some challenges as well. And uh, as, as part of that uh, overall challenge, we've built this team, we've started this program to help our customers, our partners, to make sure that you're successful in these uh, multi-cloud deployments. So we're a combination of uh, teams from uh, our success group, our product teams, uh, the alliances team like Stefan and Sanjay, and our sales teams so that we can start to put together an overall vision of how we can help uh, customers be successful. Um, the second piece really is helping kind of pave the way of how art of the how, right? Everything that we're doing is really defining um, how do we do certain things? What are the best practices? And this webinar series is an example of that uh, exercise of defining the how and being a lot more prescriptive around what we think is best practices and how it lines up with some of our future products and roadmaps. So that's kind of the other piece at the part of this program and, and how we can help, help you guys in the, in the future as well. So that's, that's that about what the cross cloud program is, who we are, and how we can help you uh, over the next, uh, next couple of years as we go through this journey. So what will we cover today? Master records, um, you know, one of the biggest things uh, as we think about <clears throat> cross cloud data, data strategy is really important, right? So why is, why is data strategy really that important before we even jump into cross cloud implementations? Um, we've started to see a lot of customers where uh, they're in the middle of a cross cloud implementation, but then they come back with some challenges and questions around, hey, what should this data flow look like? And I think it's really important that we cover these topics uh, a lot more earlier in the process as a whole. Um, the other piece that we're gonna cover is where should be that master record be to build a 360 view of the customer, right? Um, where should that record ID be? What should be the database record for watch? What is the best practice around it? Um, the last part uh, is around kind of the profile creation and synchronization. So if you are creating a profile, what does that flow look like? And if we're synchronizing across clouds as someone makes a change, what should that look like? What are the best practices there? And ultimately that all leads into that no matter what we do, we have to always take into account what are those different events and actions that actually trigger uh, these changes? And then what are the ultimate perform performance considerations for this? So we're gonna cover these topics. Um, and as we say, right, don't forget to uh, share your questions via the questions panel. Uh, you know, your questions are really important. I think that's where, you know, a lot of kind of back and forth can happen in terms of what is, what is top of mind for you guys that we can answer. What are areas that we haven't covered that we should be covering as well. So, you know, please ask questions. Uh, it's really, really important. And then the last part obviously is complete the survey. Your feedback is super important. You know, the last time we did this, we got a bunch of feedback. We've actually made changes to the content based on that. Um, so again, this is, this is really important. So please let us know what you like, what you didn't like so that we can change those pieces. Uh, before I start, there were key, uh, for those that didn't attend yesterday, um, there were a couple of key points from yesterday that uh, I think is really important to kind of walk through one more time. And, and why that leads into what we're talking about today. And for those that I haven't, as, uh, as Stefan mentioned, um, the recording is available on the partner community uh, and internally as well on Chatter. So typically when we see some of the cross cut implementations, uh, here's some of the key things that we've seen go wrong uh, or are challenges that our customers need to uh, solve for. Really, it's, it's really the, that the cross cloud use cases are implemented in silos. What we've seen is, you know, someone's focusing on, let's say, abandoned card. They're doing all the pieces on, on one cloud, but then they're not looking at the overall uh, set of goals that um, need to be delivered across all the clouds. Uh, the second item is uh, duplicate or fragmented customer data. This has been really, really apparent in a lot of our cross cloud uh, deals or cross cloud uh, implementations recently. The lack of master record strategy uh, has actually introduced sometimes duplicate customer records or fragmented relationships and customers aren't able to truly get that 360 view that we talk about all the time as how we can achieve that with Salesforce clouds. 
the third piece is really around synchronization lifetime and data processing. Uh, you know, there's a lot of data that goes back and forth. Marketing Cloud creates a lot of data. What are, what are things that you need to consider? What pieces do you really bring in? And what do you not bring in? And ultimately, all of this leads to that lack of trust in that uh, 360 view of the customer, right? So because of that, we, we are not able to truly show that entire view. And uh, ultimately, uh, you know, the other piece that comes up is with a lot of additional duplicate data or incomplete data, uh, we start to hit some of the data volumes. I know some of the partners here on the call probably have already gone through this in the past with their customers. And it, it does take effort. It, it actually, again, you know, leads to kind of a lack of trust in the overall solution. I think there's one theme you see across all of this, uh, and it's really all comes to back to the data and the data strategy that we put together. And that's why it's really important that we think and talk about this before we look at actually implementing the different connectors and the use cases and things like that. So let's start with the master record challenge. You know, ultimately, why do we do all of this, right? Ultimately, we're putting together this data strategy to ultimately drive three things. Engagement with the customer, personalization, how do we drive, you know, the right set of emails, the right set of segmentations, lifestyle targeting for all those customers. And then from a service perspective, really putting together, you know, a really comprehensive or a personalized service by the service agent. Right. You should be able to, if done right with the data strategy, you should be able to get the entire history. You should be able to get things like next best offers, et cetera, that we'll talk about in the next couple of sessions. But as you well know, just like we covered yesterday, that our data today is segmented, right? We, we have a customer that has multiple emails. We have a customer that uses part of their name in one interaction but part of, and a full name in the other interaction. Or in some cases, they don't want to create a profile, so they do guest checkouts, and the, the, the names and the numbers are different. And this leads to a very disconnected uh, experience because we can't put it all together. Really, one of the key pieces as part of that is to build that customer ID that we can use across uh, all of our clouds to build that one customer view. So in today's world, uh, that is going to be that primary key that we talk about. Uh, and in the future, there's also gonna be this global unified ID that you know, one of our products that we've announced last year at Dreamforce called Customer 360 will support. But all of the stuff we covered today is going to be covered on the experiences you can build using the products that we have today itself. So when you also think about the integration models today, right? it's a point-to-point -point integration. I've connected marketing to service, to commerce, and then I connect all the other pieces on top of it. So I've got multiple different point connections. And how do you actually put it all together, right? As we think about all of these, there's typically five key areas that we think about from a data strategy perspective. What is that common identifier? Do we persist data in one place? Do we federate that data instead? What are those events that actually enable us to integrate these things? And then what are those actions that you're gonna take on that specific data? And then what kind of volume you're gonna support? As we look into each of those, right, what we mean by that master record or a customer identifier is really what is that primary key? Where's that master live? And what is gonna be that master? Is it gonna be the record ID, the customer ID? Is it gonna be the subscriber ID or something external? Or is it gonna be all four somehow linked together? What is the right approach? What is that database of record? Which cloud is specifically going to persist that information? Uh, which are the fields and objects that make sense to be able to capture that information? Uh, and then triggers, what are the triggers that drive those specific events, right? Is it going to be, uh, you know, are we updating certain content uh, based on requests? Are, do we need to think about all the preferences? You know, opt-in, opt-out preferences, preference centers uh, related to then things like compliance, delete requests with GDPR especially. Um, how do we, or the new California law that's coming up next year, how do we manage all of this information? Is it going to be all done through API responses or other things that we, we take into account? And then of the appropriate actions that we're going to take, right? Are we deduplicating something? Are we merging the records? How do we make sure that we check the right pieces? And then ultimately the data volume, which is to say, what are those limitations that exist uh, in processing and sharing that data? 
this really is a overall conceptual um, record. Uh, when you think about how each of the pieces fit in, uh, this is really how we think about uh, the overall um, customer master record and how it fits in also with kind of the future vision that we have as Salesforce. So on the left, you've got kind of the key master customer information. Uh, and this would be, you know, the, the specific related to the actual ID and how we store it, where we store it. And the information that makes it specifically is the name, email address, phone numbers, addresses, customer IDs, genders, other things that actually drive that specific customer information. Uh, that will be used as a way to then ultimately uh, parse or uh, define that specific uh, individual. And again, you know, we use this as an individual um, versus, uh, versus you know, a family unit or anything like that, right? And we're talking about the specific individual in this case. And then you have in the middle kind of a bunch of business logic that you're gonna take care of, you're gonna do certain activities, data definitions, et cetera, because ultimately all of that is being built by their actions. In this case, it would be things like the customer transactions or history. It could be potential computed data that you're doing. So if you've got a loyalty program or things like that, you're putting that together and computing all of that information uh, based on their interactions and uh, transactions that they're, they're engaging with, with you on. And then last but not least is really the consent and the preferences, right? Taking into account things like subscription management, <clears throat> what, is, what are they subscribing to? What are they opting in, opting out? Do they have do not track requests? What are all those different things that we need to kind of think through? And then ultimately you may have some other additional information that you're keeping track of that user or the customer um, in any other systems, right? So it could be financial data, it could be some other information uh, that you don't need to have it from a master record perspective, but you still wanna have that information. And when you think about it from how that fits into the Salesforce ecosystem, here's how we kind of think about all that information, right? Your master customer information really sits in the sales cloud, service cloud over here on the left. And then really the CRM contact that we're going to talk about in a lot more detail next uh, is really your record um, <clears throat> as the master. And you also want to think about is what are those minimal required attributes that you want to have to define that specific master and the appropriate uh, associations with the sources related to those primary keys. In the logic, you've got kind of a couple of options, right? You can connect all of this stuff through the out of box point to point connectors that we have uh, that provide kind of the core capabilities and, and core use cases. And we will cover some of those use cases next week as well as uh, you can go with something a little bit more advanced, right? You've got tons of data, you've got you know, 500 million records that you wanna uh, evaluate before you segment and do certain things. That's where you use some of these advanced uh, pieces like Roku to do some of that. Or are you gonna use MuleSoft as a way to drive <clears throat> uh, integrations into all the other individual systems of records to build and, and bring that data in so that you can ultimately bring all of that into that uh, or associate that to the master record or that key across all the different systems. And then you've got <clears throat> the individual source uh, systems of records uh, and engagement uh, that then line up either with the additional systems you have. So you could have it, some information stored in commerce, some in marketing, uh, communities, et cetera. That's really kind of the broader picture of how all of these different systems fit in to build it. <clears throat> and when you think about it, it really is that the primary key should really come from CRM, right? When you think about the three clouds that we're talking about integrations over here, you know, within Marketing Cloud, when you really think about it, there's actually a contact key. And that's really meant to be the cross-channel customer ID that you use within Marketing Cloud. Um, back in the day, it used to be only uh, the email because uh, Marketing Cloud slash exact target uh, only had uh, email capabilities. The minute we started to add the uh, mobile, mobile connect or mobile push, the email ID doesn't really work. It doesn't make sense to use as the key because a phone number does not equate to the mo uh, email number. So the contact key that's built for contact builder is really the core customer ID or the unique customer ID they want to use in Marketing Cloud. Similarly, in, in B2C Commerce, the, there is a customer ID that is used, that is a system generated ID that you can use across the board. 
There's also a customer number, but customer number could be replicated uh, depending on your customer segments or customer list that you have. Uh, so it could be repeated. It's better to use the customer ID across B2C commerce. It's that one unique ID that can use uh, across B2C commerce. And then ultimately from a service cloud perspective, it's the contact ID that you're gonna use as the primary across all the different clouds. So what this really means is, when you think about the key considerations as you're putting together the primary key, you really wanna think about it from the perspective, one, do not use email. Um, it is super important, that's why it's bolded. Uh, it really is a very limited view of how, what you can do with the primary keys. And it can also lead to some other cha challenges because you do change email address. People change email addresses all the time. And if you change it, then now all of a sudden you're creating duplicate records uh, or duplicate users, which you don't want to. And also it doesn't solve for the cross-channel uh, use cases uh, that we uh, see a lot of our customers starting to build. The second piece is um, <clears throat> also if you start to use things like a CRM record ID across the board, that one ID makes things simple, especially when you start to think about can spam compliances in the US or the GDPR model. So when you start to say, hey, uh, this user or this individual wants to be forgotten or this individual wants to opt out or they want to do some things, using that one ID really makes it easy for us to then call the other systems uh, via API or whatever mechanisms we use to then opt them out, to delete information, whatever the case may be, right? So it's really important that we start to think about and that contact ID in this case, to be used across all the different systems. Um, but more importantly, the other piece of this is that if you connect Marketing Cloud and Service Cloud or Core, uh, Marketing Cloud Connect is really dependent on having that primary key being from Service Cloud uh, because you want to bring that data, engagement data back from Marketing Cloud into Service Cloud, so the agent can see if they've opened an email or they've clicked that email. You have the ability to create reports around what is kind of the engagement you're looking at from a customer's perspective. It becomes a lot more easier when you build some of those pieces in the Salesforce core Service Cloud platform because the reporting in all those pieces are much easier for that business user to be able to track and do all of that information. The second piece is um, within Commerce Cloud, the other piece you can also do is you can you can actually decorate the Commerce Cloud customer record with that CRM customer ID. And once you have that created, you can now associate both the Commerce Cloud and the contact ID from Core uh, to be used across the different clouds as well. Um, this is actually, you can add any kind of IDs in Commerce Cloud from that perspective. And the way the connector, again, we'll cover that next week. When the connector is actually used, it will go and create that contact ID for you in CRM and then bring that back into Commerce Cloud. So it's not that you're replacing uh, the cu customer ID, you're still gonna have customer ID in com B2C Commerce, but this is the additional ID that's stored with uh, the Commerce Cloud itself. So you can use both those uh, within Commerce Cloud itself. And then if you're using any kind of external system, what you want to do is use that customer ID uh, in the external customer ID across the clouds through connecting into Service Cloud, but then within the Salesforce ecosystem, you want to use the, uh, the core CRM ID uh, or the contact ID they can use across all the different uh, connections or the different clouds as well. Um, and if you, uh, if you don't, right, I think one of the things is you may have to then start to think about doing more of the custom solutions. So ultimately, really what happens with the contact ID is that it really simplifies all the integrations between community, commerce, marketing, um, and, and really makes it easy for you to start to create that one customer view uh, that we talked about consistently. Here's an example of a flow of how you would think about some of these things and what's actually happening if you go one level deeper. So let's say I've got, I've got a lead record that comes in. Uh, and you know in this example, uh, because I've got a business use case where I, want, I have a new product coming in and I want to capture some of those leads. As that lead becomes more engaged, we may convert them into a specific contact. And with that contact, what you would do, uh, by the way, before I actually jump uh, deeper into this, let me just give you a quick uh, orientation on this, right? The 
The blue box is obviously a sales and service. The orange is marketing cloud. And the green is commerce cloud. All the white boxes are essentially uh, records that created in that specific platform or cloud. And then the actual um, blue boxes, right, like this example, are uh, records that get created via the integration between the different clouds. So in this example, as I was talking about, you're going to have a lead ID that's created first. And then once that lead gets convert, uh, when that leads gets created, there's actually an existing contact ID that gets created uh, within Marketing Cloud through Marketing Cloud Connect. And that's going to be the contact key and the subscriber key. Uh, the subscriber key is created uh, when you generate the contact key. The, if you have imported data that you're bringing in through other external systems, so let's say there's a bunch of records that, or a bunch of leads that you got at an event show or something like that, you would import that into Marketing Cloud for engagement. That would actually get created, again, as a separate key uh, within Marketing Cloud. So now you're going to have a contact key with, for those set of customers or individuals, actually, and then a, a appropriate subscriber key for those individuals. Now, if a lead gets converted into a contact, what happens is now you're going to have a, a separate ID for that contact within Sales and Service Cloud. And that sales and service cloud contact ID also gets converted into a contact key. So now you're actually starting to look at potentially two records for that same customer. So this is again part of the reason why you want to think through, you know, what is it that you build out from a lead ID and a contact ID perspective? Does it do you really need that lead ID? Do you really need um, can you just deal with just a contact? Um, and if you're going to have a lead on contact, be aware that some of that historical information will be split up, right? And if you need to merge, that actually requires some additional work in terms of how you would merge that, uh, merge those records. So now let's say you created the contact ID, you have that contact ID and subscriber key that's created. What's interesting is, let's look at a different flow. The different flow here would be something like, um, I actually created, create a profile within uh, Commerce Cloud. So I'm a, I'm a uh, currently I'm a non-registered user on Commerce Cloud. I've just created my new profile. With the connector that exists between Commerce and Core or Service Cloud, when you create that contact ID in, uh, when you create that user in Commerce Cloud, we, we send that request to Service Cloud, and we're going to check if that contact actually exists already. And the matching can be done. The matching is done using the connector. Looks at the email address. It looks at like first name, last name, and it comes back and says, "Yep, this user exists in Service Cloud or Commerce Cloud." No, sorry, Service Cloud. And that user then gets a ID which already exists in Service Cloud. So in this example, this is created through the integration. So you're going to have a customer number or customer ID in Commerce Cloud, and then there's an associated uh, service cloud ID that is associated here as well. And then when you take that from an engagement perspective, so now I've purchased something, what it's doing is it's actually going to send that triggered email to Marketing Cloud with that specific service cloud ID and email address. So now you have a full 360 already created, because what, what's going to happen here is this ID is already created. It already knows who the customer is, so you can now start to actually just use that same ID across the board. The other piece here as well is, let's say you actually have a brand new user that's created that doesn't exist anywhere in the system yet. So now you would create a Commerce Cloud ID, uh, sorry, you're going to create a Commerce Cloud user first as a profile. Uh, I'm going to, uh, Commerce Cloud Connector will now go check Service Cloud and see, hey, if this exists or not. And if it doesn't exist, it will actually create a contact ID first. Uh, so in this case, 2346. That then gets brought back to Commerce Cloud, and then Commerce Cloud stores that specific customer ID with that user. And then if you haven't engaged with them yet, you don't need to send them an email or something like that. What will happen is when the Marketing Cloud Connect synchronizes, it will then go create 2346 as those contact IDs and subscriber keys within uh, Marketing Cloud itself. So just by setting this up and keeping 
uh, the master customer ID in Service Cloud, you're able to truly start to build that same key across all the different clouds that we have. And it really makes it easy then to build that 360 profile view that we're talking about. If the, con if the contact already exists with that same core ID, Mark Nagel Connect will not create a new ID. It will actually use that same contact key. So again, you're able to kind of look at some of those capabilities and create uh, that uh, you know, one ID across all the different clouds. So again, uh, you know, we can, we can, if you have questions on this, please start to ask some of those questions. We can dive deeper into it. But this at least gives you a quick view of how some of these uh, capabilities fit in. Mihir, would you be happy to, uh, to take on a couple of questions before we move on? Yeah, absolutely. Let's Excellent. So I, got, uh, I actually got a couple of these for you. Uh, and I think it, it makes sense to just you know, maybe stop here before we cover the rest of the content. So one of them was on, when you were talking about the conceptual master record and how different mm. systems for, uh, are being used to, to complement that master record with additional, additional user info. Is it possible to use external objects and wire them to Commerce Cloud? As, so similar how you would do that on the force.com platform? Or do you have to synchronize the data uh, with, uh, the, with force.com first and then, for example, push the data out to Commerce Cloud? What is the kind of the wiring there? So I, would, um, I, think, I think if I understand the question correctly, the way you want to think about the external system or the external ID, so let's say you've got a data mart or uh, some other place where you have, you're storing all the customer information and it's, it's kind of the external overall master. What you want to do is engage that customer ID itself uh, within Service Cloud. But then if you need data from Commerce Cloud into the external system, certainly that integration could take place. Um, but what you want to do is you want to drive the actual customer ID uh, through Service Cloud and then Service Cloud is going to be uh, between Commerce and Service, you would use the Service Cloud ID. Uh, and then uh, same thing with uh, uh, Service Cloud and Marketing, you would use the Service Cloud ID. Right. Um, but the data itself that you have, let's say it's order data as an example, you know, you, you can still kind of integrate that order data. You can bring the external ID even in Commerce Cloud, you can have that. But the way you want to think about this is all the all that information needs to be ultimately lined up to that one customer ID that you can use. Excellent. Uh, within the uh, cloud itself. How can Hopefully they, that answer this? How, how would you say can a customer decide if the master record can reside in the CRM in that case, service cloud, uh, in a, in the scope of a larger implementation? Sometimes, would you say it makes more sense to have that master record in an ERP or in a different system, any data store, data lake that is a like a third party system? Yeah. Uh, so this uh, this happens a lot within within some of the complex uh, implementations. So I think the the way the way we we recommend or think about this is there's a couple of things. One, from a master data lake, etc. You know, think about the Salesforce clouds and systems as that transactional system, right? You're, you're using the Salesforce systems as a to engage that customer. That does not mean you bring every record that you have uh, into uh, Salesforce. So if you have a huge uh, you know, customer list, as an example, uh, that you're storing in a data lake, the information that you bring into Salesforce should be the ones where you're actually going to engage with those customers. If you're not gonna engage with those customers for whatever reason, you don't need to bring those into uh, Salesforce. Uh, it's better to leave them into the, in that data mart uh, where you continue to have that history. What does this mean? It actually means that, yeah, you need to take into account some additional uh, business processes during the implementation phase itself. So some more complex customers have certain rules that they've set up. Um, you know, if your customer hasn't engaged in, uh, again, I'm making a number up, but let's say within a year, uh, then what they do is they actually remove that contact from uh, the core system and they don't need that information, right? So you're actually taking care of storage limits and things like that uh, within the Salesforce core platform, uh, as well as uh, taking into account that you only need to have information that you're going to engage with. There's also another piece to this, right? The other piece here is going to be if that customer is no longer engaged and you're not really doing much with them, then this is where uh, you would also have additional business logic to then when the customer again engages, you have the option to either bring some of that data back in, either that old customer ID, 
or you can actually create a new system user, but then you're going to deduplicate that customer within that external system um, so that you can have that overall record in that data mark. So there's different rules, and a lot of it depends on the business processes of that customer in terms of how they want to track and, and what they want to do. Um, but the, the key piece is really that um, you know the external ID would be something you would bring into the the um, the core like service cloud uh, or core platform, and then to engage and use across the Salesforce clouds, you want to use the service cloud ID across the board. Right. I want to dive a little deeper into this. So um, just staying with that example that, uh, that we keep the, the master system is going to be sales cloud and defining that, uh, that master record or defining that unique identifier for a master record. Does that put any limitations into or from your experience? Would that limit the customer creation process at some point? I mean, the example that was given here was that you may not want every marketing cloud contact to be stored in sales cloud because the servicing only kicks off after a certain milestone is reached. What is your opinion on that? Right. Um, so let me kind of think through that a little bit. So if you have a marketing cloud, if, if you, so my assumption here is based on the question that was asked is that you're importing a lot of data into marketing cloud and you're creating, let's just go to this uh, picture. You're essentially creating a lot of these kinds of records. Um, Correct. And yeah, so I think I think this is kind of where if, if you're doing this, you don't, and you're essentially using them as a batch and blast service. Um, yeah, you're right. You don't need to bring them into this overall flow of, of of contacts. I think this is where it becomes a little bit more complicated because if you if you're only using them for batch and blast, I think that's fine. You would keep them here. It's, it's the minute you want to start to have a much deeper relationship with that customer, you need to start to bring some of those contacts in. Now, the challenge is <clears throat> if you're only doing this, there is going to be some issue with duplicate records because if you bring them in as a contact here now, what you need to do is make sure that you're able to use this contact ID back as the key contact ID. Otherwise, as it stands today, you're going to have duplicate records. So the batch and blast experience for that user that you've brought in through external systems is going to remain there unless you do some you do some kind of a key migration for those specific users. Um, so I think this is again goes back to kind of a business process of you know what is it that you want to do with those what kind of history tracking you want to keep um, because once the user gets engaged as a true uh, individual that is loyal to this brand or whatever the case may be, you you would want to have this entire 360 view set up. Uh, and you may not be as worried about the batch and blast stuff as much as you know where you're engaging with them with the orders and things like that. So it may be okay. So I think this is kind of a business decision of what it means and how you're going to um, how you're actually going to uh, integrate uh, the clouds uh, and integrate the contact IDs more than anything else. To be honest, so. But I think uh, if you could confirm that, what what is clear is that if you want to move records that originate in marketing cloud and you want to move them to commerce because you want to build uh, other functionality around uh, feature functions in commerce cloud and you have sales and service cloud, you would still move the record from marketing cloud to service cloud so that it gets that you know unique identifier from service cloud and then move it to commerce cloud. Well, right. so so I, mean, I, I, think I, would, I would say it a little bit differently. Um, if you're if you already have a bunch of contacts in marketing cloud, um, and you're not you're only using them for just more of a batch and blast type use case, um, you don't need to bring those into service cloud. The only time you're going to bring those types of contacts into service cloud is if you're going to start to have a much deeper relationship with them. So right. if I have a contact, let's say uh, I'm only being used by brand A to be used as a batch and blast, right? I, I may not interact with them at all. The minute, the moment I interact with them is, let's say I actually clicked on that email that was sent by this, some you know, marketing list that was imported into Marketing Cloud. When I go and select that ID, and when I go and select that contact, uh, or so, sorry, and when I click that email, I'm, let's say I get sent into the commerce site. I get sent into the commerce site, now I'm actually a new customer within Commerce Cloud. And this is where, when I create that customer profile, what's going to happen is I'm actually going to be um, 
creating a new service cloud customer ID, which will be the contact ID um, that's created in, in the core master. And then I'm going to have another ID that's created within, um, uh, within Marketing Cloud. So now I've got, as a, as a customer, I've got contact key 013 that, that was used for the batch and blast. And then I've got a contact key 2345 that's going now being used as my engagement uh, keys essentially across the board. Okay. Does that does that make sense? Makes sense. Right. Makes now sense. The, the way you want to the, the, the way you want to engage then is this is kind of part of where the segmentation piece comes in. And some of this will be actually custom work that will be required to be done in Marketing Cloud to then do a check. And this is unfortunately part of the challenge that I think the, the person asking this question is maybe referring to is that you need to then look at doing a little bit of deduping work within Marketing Cloud to be able to merge these records if you wanted to. Or what you need to do is then look at how do you engage with customers that have purchased something and what you do with those customers um, and, and be able to kind of do some of that uh, lookups. So that's kind of the, the, the challenge that needs to happen and it, it does require some custom work as it stands there. Makes sense. One very last question uh, before I let you move on. Um, there's a question here, what happens if uh, you have Sales and Service Cloud and Sales and Service Cloud have minimum requirements to uh, create a contact or lead? Uh, and you, for example, only have email address. So Marketing Cloud would supply records that would only include an email address. How would you typically go about uh, creating that Service Cloud identifier? Is that, what, what would be your recommendation? Are you going to be working with, uh, I mean, the worst case scenario, inserting fake data? into the mandatory contact lead fields, or how would you go about that? So part of this is gonna be the ingest forms that you have, right? So the way I think about this is, if you're actually gonna create leads, uh, or you know, essentially a initial contact to engage with, the way you would want to think about doing your uh, uh, ingest forms is that you ask them the minimum information that is needed, right? So if you think about a web to lead form, or a contact form that's created as a way to, hey, are you interested in my in, in our services or in our offerings? You know, sign up here. When you sign up, you want to collect that basic information of first name, last name, email, as an example, if, if that's all you want to collect, uh, so that you have that information. And you want to bring that in first into Sales and Service Cloud, so that when that contact gets generated by the integration between Marketing Cloud and uh, Service Cloud, it will then get created into Marketing Cloud. You don't want to bring that directly into Marketing Cloud first. You want to create that record in Sales and Service first, and then bring that into Marketing Cloud using the Marketing Cloud Connect uh, connection. So I, I think that's a really important point to keep in mind is that, yeah, the ingest forms that you're going to have, uh, lead forms you're going to have, would ideally go into core uh, to create that contact ID before you bring them into Marketing Cloud using the Marketing Cloud Connect Cloud. Cool. Thanks, Mihir. Uh, thank you. I really appreciate the questions. Uh, please keep them coming, um, and we can kind of work through. And I think I think this table that I'm just going to go through potentially will answer some of those uh, questions for you as well. So the the way this table is set up is you think about it from the perspective of what has so what the customer already has. What are they adding? What are those key recommendations? And what are the considerations you need to think about? So let's walk through that. Right? They have already service cloud or sales cloud, and then they add marketing cloud. Uh, in this example, you're using the contact ID as the MC contact key, right? So you want to do that, which is the best practice anyways that we just walked through. Really the biggest piece that you want to think about, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, is that um, uh, the service cloud storage and volume considerations, right? You don't want to bring all the data into service cloud. You only want to bring in enough data into service cloud that will allow you to resolve and do some of the work that we're talking about. Uh, otherwise, you may hit storage limits, and uh, that typically means additional costs and charges for the customers, which is never a fun, fun conversation to have. The second part is, as I mentioned earlier, right? If you're going to use a lead ID, that may result in a duplicate record, or not only even say duplicate record, but it will be essentially prim separate primary records in the other clouds. Um, but that's a business decision again of how we engage and how we set up and how we actually track that information. Now, if you have a service cloud and you've added commerce cloud, the key piece here, again, again, this is the simpler use case, which is 
you map the uh, commerce.customer ID to the service cloud contact ID. The customer ID within Commerce Cloud is still this customer Commerce Cloud's unique ID for the profile that it's doing all the work in Commerce Cloud, but storing that service cloud contact ID will future proof all that integration with Marketing Cloud in the future. Now let's say they have Marketing Cloud and you've added a Commerce Cloud later. Now the key piece here is you, you could actually continue to use the existing Marketing Cloud keys. Uh, what you want to do in this case is um, that you're and then adding a um, Commerce Cloud field to the Marketing Cloud contact key. Uh, and this allows you to again have the matching between Commerce and Marketing Cloud. And then you can also do a day zero import of all the Marketing Cloud contacts into Commerce Cloud profiles. So you can actually start with, a, with, with that list of uh, uh, customers uh, with the appropriate keys uh, mapped out. Um, typically, when you have just a Marketing Cloud and Commerce Cloud from Salesforce, you probably have some kind of a third party system that has um, a CRM uh, system or some other kind of system, uh, you know, a data mart or, or CDP or something that you're using that is creating an overall external ID, which may be some of the original questions that were asked. Um, in which case really the, you know, there's some work that needs to happen, right? In terms of how you're going to uh, make that work because the marketing cloud, commerce cloud contact key uh, would want to be used the same way as you were going to create a Commerce Cloud Service Cloud sub record creation. So the way that would work then is you probably want to then have that third party system ID being used across both places, uh, just like we're doing a Service Cloud type uh, creation, so that you can actually again create that three uh, or the 360 view uh, from that perspective. Um, Key considerations, again, within this specific use case uh, is that, again, as you think about from a migration perspective, you don't really need to do any kind of migration for those existing marketing cloud subscribers uh, from a key migration perspective. Um, the day zero uh, import of existing, uh, you know, you do need to think about that. You won't probably want to do that first anyways, so that you can start with a fresh, clean a set of slate of, of customer data or clean data. Uh, consider the Commerce Cloud customer and Marketing Cloud subscriber data flow implication on this design, which kind of I briefly mentioned. Um, this is something that really needs to be thought through. Uh, there's different paths you can take, honestly. Um, and, you know, uh, especially if there's no third party system or third party ID that exists, you need to kind of think through how you're going to use that across the board as well. Um, now let's go to something a little bit more challenging. So let's say you have Marketing Cloud and Commerce Cloud, and in the future you add Service Cloud. So things become a lot simpler for the Commerce Cloud uh, use case. You just add the Commerce Cloud field uh, with the Service Cloud uh, contact ID. Um, for the Marketing Cloud, you have to make a choice. Um, and again, this will be dependent on the customer, right? We've seen customers where They've just got so much data and then that customer history isn't as important to them, in which case you could, you could essentially lose that customer data that existed before and you start fresh. Uh, but if that customer history is really important in terms of their engagement and things like that, then you have to think about doing a sub key migration. So that marketing cloud subscriber key migration really requires professional services. Uh, from Salesforce because we're actually changing uh, the core data within uh, Marketing Cloud itself. So we're looking at all the opens, clicks, um, engagement data. Uh, we're looking at the actual subscriber lists, uh, all subscriber lists, et cetera, and then changing all of that within the core database of Marketing Cloud itself, uh, which is only available to the internal teams uh, because it actually impacts the actual database. Uh, the biggest challenge here is that it it will lead to uh, outage. It could be as little as a couple hours, uh, depending on how coordinated uh, the teams are, uh, or it could be a couple of days. And I think this is, again, a business decision that needs to be made by your customer in terms of what they want to do and how important is it for them. There are other ways of doing this. We don't really recommend it, to be very honest, because you're not truly changing the core ID in the core database itself but you could do different tables and, and additional customizations. It's just, it's not a clean solution. Uh, same thing, you know, if you have Marketing Cloud and you have Service Cloud, it's really making a decision whether you're going to, um, going to do the subscriber key migration or, uh, you know, you essentially say, 
forget the old data, we're going to start fresh. Um, so I think this may help answer some of the questions that were asked earlier as well in terms of what are the different choices and what it will lead to. I think that covers pretty much all the key items from a primary key uh, perspective. Let's go into a little bit uh, of kind of the database of record and how do you think about this? You know, this, this is a very uh, academic uh, slide, right? When you really think about what is the right approach that you want to think about, whether you, should you have a distributed database of record, should you have a you know, master system of record that you're going to use for a customer? And really a lot of it depends on kind of the key considerations as a customer and what's important to them. Um, so let's talk latency first, right? Um, I think the first piece is, do you really need uh, something that's near real time? I wouldn't say real time. The reason is if you want true real time, it just is a lot of effort. And to be honest, for a lot of the stuff that we do and a lot of customers that we do, a five minute delay or a 10 minute delay is really not that uh, consequential and it's okay. And I think it allows you to create solutions that are a lot uh, simpler. Uh, so I think it's important to kind of understand that requirement from the customer and, uh, and, and prescribe that capability or, or you know challenging that or what what does real time really mean for them but you know latency is one of the big factors right by by doing the distributed data as a record you're able to drive uh, some of those uh, actions in a much better uh, better format because your record is where it's supposed to be and you can actually do that but the master system record you need to be a little bit more delay tolerant you may have to batch some of the content uh, some of the customers together uh, and then you can put them into the system of engagement and then send it out. Or you'll have to have some kind of scheduled set of events, uh, things like that. Um, the data posture, the way you think about the data in, in a distributed database or record system is that you're trusting the payload, right? You're assuming that the data in the appropriate system is accurate, is trustworthy, and you're going to be able to call an API and then send, pick that data up and send it out. Whereas in the master system record, you really need to verify that payload. You want to make sure that you're looking up the information, is it accurate, is it, is it trustworthy? And then once it's trustworthy, you can actually take the appropriate actions. Um, some of the examples, right, from a data, distributed database record perspective, you know, things like uh, case stations, uh, abandoned cart, or if you're just doing certain record updates, profile updates, um, all of that makes sense with a distributed database record approach. Areas where you want to think about potentially doing a master system record, could be things like segmenting an audience. So I think there was a question asked around, you know, customers having a data lake or some other systems. I think this is where you're collecting all of the information to that one system, and then you're segmenting those different resources. Uh, you're pre-processing essentially all of this information ahead of time so that you can then engage with that set of customers based on loyalty, based on, you know, different criteria that you may want to use uh, to segment that specific audience. So we see that happen a lot especially where you have a data link and you're collecting all of the information in one place. Um, data profile, again, obviously, as we said, right, like the key piece here is that you're, you're assuming the accuracy of that first party data uh, is, is taken care of. Um, and then from the master system record perspective, it's really, uh, you know, what does the accuracy look like uh, for, um, uh, for the different uh, non-volatile type information or the data sets. Challenges, uh, really the key piece here is that you need to enrich the message, right? Because you don't have all the data in one place, you need to make sure you make the appropriate API calls, you're putting, bringing that data in as needed and then uh, engaging the customer with that specific data from the different systems. Whereas with the master system record, you've got a little bit of a time delay built into that interaction, but you do need to think about obviously storing all of the information and having a lot more redundant data. Uh, so it's, again, it's a trade-off that you would make anyways. And the biggest thing really is distributed data is all around agility and you want to be able to essentially make quick changes and engage with that customer. And then really the master student record is more around driving those customer insights, uh, creating those refined segmentations, calculations, et cetera. So that's really the key pieces of how we think about it. Um, the one thing I want to highlight is as, as we think about a Salesforce, um, we are looking at that distributed database of record approach in terms of how we're approaching um, this as it stands today, right? Uh, in the future, there may be additional capabilities, products that come up that will be, uh, so I'm sure you, I don't know if you've heard, but Marketing Cloud 
we announced a uh, customer data platform as well uh, early, uh, actually a few weeks ago, that will actually take care of that overall system of record type solutions. And then we're going to use uh, other capabilities like Customer 360 uh, that will also be launched later Q4 this year as the distributed data of record. So we can have both systems just depending on what you want to do and the use cases that you have. So if you think about this slide, really the key, key piece here is how do you think about those different systems and what information are you storing in each of those systems from a distributed database of record perspective? Um, the, the Commerce Cloud in this case obviously has kind of the profile attributes and within that profile attributes, what it's really storing is the order, the order line item, the product catalog, uh, the sales and service kind of has the case, opportunity account information. Obviously the marketing cloud has the opt-in preferences, tracking the channels and, and how we can engage them. And then the individual itself right here at the bottom is um, the actual person and you're storing essentially their external IDs there. You're storing the contact information as it stands and uh, that is how you would have the distributed IDs. You're going to essentially have only enough information in each of those to drive certain capabilities. And then as you think about each of these, you also want to have the core consent. This is opt-in, opt-out, delete requirements, all of that stuff in one place with that individual. And then each system in itself will have the appropriate consent related uh, information. So if you wanted to delete all their engagement history, you would essentially make an API call to Marketing Cloud to lead all their engagement history, as an example. Um, but the core, core uh, consent and uh, preferences would be stored with the individual itself. And in this case, it would be the CRM. <clears throat> so as we, as we, uh, I've kind of covered some of these pieces already, but as we think about this, Really, when you think about the recommendations and how we approach it across the different clouds, really want to start to leverage the cloud's native data model strengths and you know what's important, what's not important, and, and what data makes the most sense. Um, the key piece is this lines up with how Customer 360 will work when it GAs. Um, and again, you know, safe harbor, but this is this is kind of the model that we're looking at right now, uh, where you're going to have that core customer ID created within um, within Customer 360, uh, which has the engine, and then you're going to use that customer ID across all the different clouds. And this really fits in with the model that we're talking about over here. Uh, the key piece, you know, the other pieces, data stewardship, data quality management is a lot more streamlined because you know that the core master in each of those uh, clouds where the store um, the profile information or order history remains is going to be accurate. You don't have to worry about uh, duplication, you don't have to make sure that, okay, is, is this the right data? Uh, you know, do we need to look at the latest data and bring it in? It's all done uh, from this perspective. Um, and really, more than anything else, it really allows you to focus on the customer's business workflows versus a lot of the data quality and challenges that typically come in with bringing all of that data into one place. So you can really focus on getting stuff running um, and, uh, you know, uh, going very quickly uh, from that perspective. Um, so as you think about what this system looks like, uh, here's kind of a really a high level reference architecture type of view uh, where you're going to have the CRM platform, really have the primary key as we talked about. It would be the database of history for all the cases, case history, and you could store some of the other information uh, depending on how much information you want to store as either a stub, right? So where you just have enough to say, uh, I have a basic record created that we did something and that X could be an order. And then when you need the actual detail information, you would go call the appropriate uh, cloud to then bring that information to be visible to the service agent or whoever the case may be. And then you would have the appropriate process and workflows created in here to then synchronize and do some of the other activities. The connectors will connect the different clouds together. And within Marketing Cloud, you're going to have the subscriber key, which will be the same as the primary key. And then you would have the appropriate segments and statuses and, and subscription management that's all taking place uh, for the engagement data uh, within Marketing Cloud. Uh, and then within Commerce Cloud, you would have the order details, uh, promotions, inventory, et cetera. So it kind of gives you a flow of how all the different pieces would fit together uh, as a 
this should be the database or record system and the primary care linking service. Um, I don't know, uh, Stefan, if it makes sense for us to break and see if there's questions. If not, I'll keep moving. I'll yeah, keep going. If, you, if you want, I can throw two or three at you right now. Okay. And I think one of them is, uh, is quite interesting and chimes in nicely with what you just presented on consent management. Um, would you recommend to insert addresses that have not yet confirmed double opt-in or whatever is going to be the standard uh, requirement in the country that the company is operating in to say it's in service cloud and give them an, an ID or identify identity, uh, instantly? Because th these records may be potentially invalid in terms of you know, GDPR compliance and, and the stuff yeah. and such. How do, you, how do you tackle that? So that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I think the double opt-in pieces, uh, if, you know, I'll have to come back to that one. I actually don't know the, the best approach here, but I think from an ingest perspective, if you're bringing that data into core first, into the sales or service clouds, the double opt-in pieces will be a confirmation that would have to be done through the preference center itself that's built um, so that you're actually doing the double opt-in. With this marketing cloud, if you use a cloud page, for example, um, then it actually has the ability to kind of have a checkbox when you do some of the, like I know like mobile connect for SMS as an example, there is an option to say, hey, we need to do a double uh, double opt-in here. And you can actually have the ability to do that double opt-in before you would accept the customer as an appropriate record within Marketing Cloud. So I think with the core piece, I would actually have to uh, get back to you guys on that. Uh, yeah. I don't know what the right thing uh, what I can share from my experience is that in, uh, once the connection is established between Marketing Cloud and Sales Service Cloud, you would absolutely want to double up in field in Sales and Service Cloud that would represent the status of, of the opt-in status of the customer, depending what kind of data the individual country is, is asking you to, to have in that data set for, for consent management, you can represent that in Sales and Service Cloud. And if that data is missing, obviously a process has to be in place that that person is not being marketed to in any shape or form. That's what I could share. Um, one more question on, uh, I think it, on earlier slides, you were relating when it comes to reference architecture, you were relating to contacts, but uh, the question was that the, the commerce service connector is using person accounts. Um, is there, like, yeah. Is, it, is there a path forward, like what, what's going to happen in the future to that kind of uh, the connector using personal accounts? Is that going to switch over to contacts or using contacts in the future? Is there anything that you can share, like the, the path forward with this and how you go about it? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I definitely understand that question. Uh, so let me, let me clarify. I think that's, uh, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, as a clarification, the, the connect, when I say a contact, what I mean by is, if you're using the person accounts, it would be the person account ID that you're gonna get. And if you're using accounts contacts, it would be the contact ID. From a connector perspective, you can actually customize the connector today to support accounts contacts. It does require some additional development work, but you can customize the connector to support that between commerce, B2C commerce and uh, service cloud. Uh, you know, again, Safe Harbor, there is a roadmap item that we're looking at to actually support accounts contacts. I don't have a timeline yet, on that, but it is definitely a priority to support uh, accounts and contacts uh, with the um, with the B2C Commerce Connector and um, and Service Club. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I when I mean primary key here, it could be a person account uh, ID or it could be the uh, contact ID. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, just two more questions. Uh, one like with a very detailed scenario on data flow, and I think also you know covering a little bit how uh, data reconciliation is going to work after the integration of of different clouds. Can you mm. outline how um, you know a record interaction could look like in the following case? So you have an anonymous purchase in Commerce Cloud, and Commerce Cloud triggers an order confirmation, like a transactional email request to Marketing Cloud. Yeah. The user creates an account in Commerce Cloud after placing the order and Commerce Cloud mm -hmm. triggers a creation request in Service Cloud. Are these interactions reconciled? Yes. So let me let me walk through the flow. I'm actually going to skip to that slide that I showed earlier. I think it may be easier to walk through this. <clears throat> so let's say I'm a uh, unknown user, right? Uh, which is kind of the, so I did, I've done a guest checkout, if I understand the question correctly. Mm -hmm. So I've done a guest checkout, 
and I only have put in my name and email address. What happens is even though we don't have um, a customer ID because they haven't uh, connected, when this gets created, there is a stub created in, in Service Cloud that is a guest checkout type stub, and it's essentially storing the email address name, uh, first name, last name, et cetera, um, to show that there was an order that was placed. And then as, as the person mentioned, uh, you would, as part of that trigger send that you want to create between uh, Commerce Cloud and Marketing Cloud, you're going to send the email address uh, and the key that you have as it stands. Uh, if you don't, it would just be a triggered send with the email address that is sent to um, uh, Marketing Cloud to send that email out. Now, when the user says, all right, I'm gonna go register, when they register in Commerce Cloud and create a profile in Commerce Cloud, they will get that Commerce Cloud uh, ID. And when the Commerce Cloud ID gets generated, the connector will go and check if there's already an existing match for that uh, a user. So if it does find an existing match, it will compare the email, name, uh, et cetera, and it will bring then that Service Cloud ID uh, into Commerce Cloud. So now you have associated the existing, uh, the, the profile and the existing sales that were taking place uh, with that uh, ID now within Commerce Cloud and Service Cloud. And then within uh, Service Cloud to Marketing Cloud with the next sync process that happens through uh, Marketing Cloud Connect, it will check, oh, is this uh, contact already existing? Do we have a subscriber key? Uh, then it will go and match that up as well. Right. Uh, so that's how the reconciliation would work between a guest checkout that then becomes a um, consumer or a you know profile customer. I think in the webinar series that we covered in December, you've been touching on this uh, in several use cases a little bit. So maybe that would be worth going back to as well and have a look at the recording. Let me hear one very last question, and and uh, you know I'm just I have to apologize to the audience that I'm getting a lot of questions around customer 360. Um, I guess when we're looking at this, the diagram that you just showed me here. Would you be able to share just one of one or two sentences on how customer 360, as in let's call it an identity store, would would solve for some of the or how this would play into the overall generation of like a customer identifier of you know just creating that golden record of data or visualize that in a sense? Is there something look, I, Eric, you can share on that? Yeah, I mean it's so like the product's still in development, so you know what I share today may or may not be accurate. So I want to be very careful about what I share here. But just at a high level, the goal of Customer 360 is to um, build that uh, common ID that would be used across uh, all the different clouds. So the way it would work is, let's say I've got a new profile that I created in Commerce Cloud or a new customer. Uh, what Customer 360 will do is it will, uh, if you've integrated and set up Customer 360 with Commerce Cloud and say Service Cloud, what Customer 360 will do is it will check to see if a set of transactions or orders or whatever exist like that uh, or with that username. So let's say I'll call it in this case email. I'm just going to say that the matching sequence is going to be email, first name, last name, just like what we do with the connector today. Um, it will go check you know, different instances of that kind of a customer. And then it will create a ID, customer ID that can be used across all the different clouds. Um, so instead of using the primary key within the CRM platform, when Customer 360 launches, you can use the primary key from Customer 360. Uh, that's kind of the, the, the whole piece of what Customer 360 will solve for. There is also other things that it will do, right? It has things like data stewardship built in as part of the process. It has the ability to kind of link the different clouds together and how which fields match with which fields in, in each of the clouds. So you can you can connect some of those things together. So it has some capabilities uh, that allows you to do some of the things. So if you look at the webinar yesterday, we briefly covered some of those pieces, what Customer 360 will do. So it may be worth doing that. Um, in terms of you know what 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 it will support and how it will be used. 
Excellent. Thanks, Mihir. Cool. No problem. Um, so let's walk through a scenario. Um, you know, how will this work? So let's say from a customer registration perspective, we're sharing a common, uh, how, how would we actually make this work? Right? So we're connected between marketing and commerce with the B2C connect, commerce to marketing cloud connector, and uh, we're, we're you know, connected commerce to service via the B2C service cloud connector. And marketing to service connected via marketing cloud connector. Once you create a profile, and this kind of goes to the flow that um, you know, I covered earlier, and this kind of just visualizes it again, um, I'm going to have a customer profile, which is the username, customer number, customer ID. Then uh, that same contact uh, that I generate in uh, Service Cloud is going to have a different contact ID. Now what happens is I'm going to actually match these two using the connectors. Uh, I have the Commerce Cloud username, I've got this, and I'm also putting in the appropriate customer ID from Commerce Cloud into uh, Service Cloud. And I'm bringing in the Service Cloud contact ID in Commerce Cloud from Service Cloud. So I've now associated these two clouds. I've got the name matching, I've got the customer ID matchings, and I've got the Service Cloud contact ID in Commerce Cloud. Then I'm adding uh, Marketing Cloud uh, through the Marketing Cloud connector, which then now you have the same subscriber ID and the contact ID for these two clouds all lined up together. So that's really kind of the flow of how the, the pieces work together, which I kind of verbally described a little bit earlier as well. Um, as you think about the considerations uh, and limitations of you know, our point-to-point -point connectors, there is something to keep in mind. The Marketing Cloud Connect does have a 15 minute sync time lag. So if you, if you need to do something that's really, you know, let's say I changed my email address just now and I just purchased something, you know, it won't already be there in Marketing Cloud. So best practice here is really that you're always going to send the commerce, the, the, the email address and the subscriber key uh, or the contact ID key, whatever you want to call it right now, the primary key with uh, the triggered send that you're going to send through Marketing Cloud. So that when we are capturing that information, it's captured with those information. So when Marketing Cloud does sync back, it has all that history. Um, which is kind of this statement really is, um, you know, because it doesn't support that, uh, you know, we need to actually do some of the work that now we're working with uh, the product team to see if we can, you know, add some of those capabilities in the future. But I don't, again, I don't have a roadmap for that right now. Um, as you see, right, if we don't have that master record strategy, we will have a fragmented uh, marketing cloud customer data. Um, because Marketing Cloud Connect specifically relates and focuses on having that contact ID from Service Cloud or Core, essentially, it's really important that we set this up the right way. Um, and again, you know, you're going to have the other challenges with this fragmentation comes increased costs uh, because you're going to have multiple records in Marketing Cloud and also the dirty customer data in Marketing Cloud, which obviously customers don't want. Um, and if it does require kind of that, you know, subscriber key migration or reorganization of all the customer data, uh, you'll actually lose customer engagement history, which isn't fun. So it's, again, just highlighting kind of the key piece uh, of why you want to do that. A couple of other things in terms of the profile orchestration and the guiding principles around it. It's really important to uh, think about a trustworthy version of the customer profile, right? Each, each cloud has that trustworthy information, and you want to make sure that the master profile lives in Service Cloud. Um, customer profile updates within Service Cloud will and should be processed on a first and first type basis. What this really means is that changes initiated in Service Cloud should then be pushed to Commerce Cloud and Marketing Cloud. If a change is initiated in B2C Commerce, push it first to Service Cloud, and then Service Cloud will push that change to Marketing Cloud. It's really important to kind of follow through that flow. So that helps with that consistency of the records, especially on profile orchestration, once you start to change some of the profile information. Um, you also wanna make sure that any profiles that are created are ideally created in Commerce Cloud and Service Cloud only. So you don't want profiles to be created in Marketing Cloud. This again goes back to the original question that was asked, which is around, hey, if I'm importing a lot of data into Marketing Cloud, what do I do with those contact IDs? 
this is kind of the challenge, right? You'll have duplicate information or you try and essentially see if it makes sense for you to create those profiles in uh, commerce or marketing first so that, oh, sorry, commerce and service first so that it can then be created into marketing tab. Um, just in time profile changes. Again, this is what I mentioned earlier, right? You always want to include the contact ID and email so that if you do things like trigger sends or journeys uh, that, um, through B2C commerce, uh, it makes sure that that latest information is used to send that information to that uh, customer. A couple of other items on uh, auditing profile changes, right? You want to make sure you have some kind of tracking history so you know that for the areas where it makes sense, right? Certain fields that are important, you know that, okay, this change was made on X date so that you know if something has changed, what it looks like. Um, and then defining the specific business rules of how we inform what profile attributes to change when it's changing, um, really having a set of business rules to define uh, what you're going to change, when you're going to change it, right? A case change doesn't require a profile attribute change. Um, but a service agent interaction, like they're changing something, may probably want to be done, right? So again, this is kind of business rules. You can use things like Process Builder, uh, especially in, in in Service Cloud to do some of those things. And then uh, differentiate between guest checkout and registered orders. Uh, this is kind of interesting. Uh, we've had some questions with customers come up where it's like, because we have the ability to know the guest checkout and then registered orders uh, through the connector and how we kind of store some of the data, uh, this is really more of a discussion again with the business to say, you know, do you want to have the service agent be able to say, yeah, you've ordered all of these in the past and we've got a full record of it. Or do you want to be able to say service agent can only show or talk about orders that were placed when they were a registered customer. So again, some of these things are just more of a business decision, but these are things that you need to take into account uh, when you're doing the profile orchestration across these three clouds and how you actually set up uh, some of the rules with the customer. Um, you know, uh, just in the interest of time, I'll quickly go through some of the other pieces as well here. Um, if you think about the guiding principles as a whole, right, each, from a data perspective, each cloud has its own governance and API limits. So it's really important. A lot of the connectors and the way the data goes back and forth is built on top of the public facing APIs. So it's important to make sure that you take that into account, right? We all know there's governor limits and API limits on core in Service Cloud, and you need to make sure that we take those into account. Um, data volume best practices. We've seen sometimes that customers bring in like, you know, huge sets of uh, rows and columns, and that actually impacts performance. Um, you know, that may, that may be areas where you need to do some pre-processing of the data before you bring it into Marketing Cloud. Um, the limits on B2C custom objects, commerce custom objects, is very different than Marketing Cloud. Marketing Cloud doesn't have huge limits, but B2C commerce does have certain limits. I forget what the number is, but it's a few hundred thousand records, for example, in, a, in an object uh, as max you can have. Um, always minimize the fields, field lengths, right? I think this is obviously uh, really important. Um, and then uh, synchronize data uh, between the clouds. Again, we've talked about this at length already, but you want to make sure that that's really you're only synchronizing data that's required so that you don't hit the storage limits. Um, the other areas, right, as you think about from a marketing to CRM perspective, uh, MC Connect Sync should only move data for personalization or segmentation, right? Use the filter, fill in, filter uh, options in Sync, uh, avoid importing data because you want to avoid data, uh, import data. Um, also, the one-way synchronization from CRM to Marketing Cloud is run every 15 minutes. So again, that's a um, uh, you know piece to kind of keep in mind as you're building the overall solution. If you do have latency concerns, right, essentially do something in real time. As I mentioned earlier, again, leverage the Journey Builder integrations it allows you to kind of do some of the triggers um, in, uh, in in more I'll call it real time. Uh, design uh, and uh, segment solutions, right? Again, this is more of a, right? What what does what does the comfort level look like for marketing cloud and CRM? You know, are they comfortable with uh, doing a report builder in CRM? And in that case, you want to bring all the data into 
a CRM so that you can actually do reports more easily? Are they comfortable doing queries in Marketing Cloud? You can then do segmentation and do some of the more work from a marketing cloud perspective. It really depends on the organization. Some customers do have technical marketers who can do those queries, and some of our customers don't. So it's really important to take that into account as we, as we build some of these solutions from marketing to core especially. And then if there's a lightning send flow that's required, so like things like lightning buttons, uh, the existing marketing cloud connector doesn't support lightning. Uh, the distributed marketing managed package actually supports lightning. So that's where you'll need to kind of think through that piece as well. You know, do they need to have a lightning send flow uh, required through their UI? Um, and then uh, again, last but not least, right? Um, journeys can be configured to modify any of the CRM data as well. So you can, you can do that. Uh, the service to commerce cloud uh, integration considerations, um, the B2C commerce uh, service cloud connector again is not designed for bulk operations. All right, you don't want to you don't want to use the connector as a way the first piece to, uh, for, you know, to do like Daisy or import or something like that. Right, you you want to do that as a separate a bulk operation that you're going to do separately. Uh, you only want to use the connector to do more of the one-to-one -one type engagements once you've got all the pieces set up. Um, which is kind of this third bullet point, which is the primary keys can be assigned through uh, to be this commerce via the merge import. Um, the, uh, this is actually something to keep in mind, as I mentioned earlier, right? Keeping the API limits in mind. The OCAPI in, uh, interactions uh, are something that um, are over the, uh, over the you know, public facing APIs. So it will count towards the uh, API limits that we have. Uh, on the governor limits uh, within uh, within Salesforce uh, Service Cloud. So I know, like we're we're getting to a time, so I'll just quickly go through this. Um, the very last slide uh, again from a marketing to commerce integration perspective, the catalog integration can be handled via data feed. So if you're going to do this, um, you can uh, set up a specific data synchronization method, uh, or you can do things like streaming updates based on what the business really requires. We'll cover a little bit of this next week. Uh, when we talk about the connectors. Um, and then obviously be mindful of the existing uh, catalog export times when planning this um, because uh, it does take time to bring all that data into Marketing Cloud and then processing it into Marketing Cloud. So um, depending on what type of data you're bringing in, how much data you're bringing in, you want to take that into account. Uh, and then obviously respect kind of the you know data extension best practices um, as, as you kind of bringing some of this data back into Marketing Cloud. And then if you have a lot of large catalogs and, and imports, uh, bring that into batches. Um, there is a, um, um, you know, if you're doing greater than 1 million rows, it definitely should be done in batches versus all together. Uh, it's going to impact performance and how much time it takes to bring all that data. This is something I, I used yesterday, uh, and I think it's, it's really important. Ultimately, when you really think about cross-cloud, and as a message, I want to make sure we, we continue to impart the next two sessions as well, right? It's really important as we look at these uh, understanding the use cases. A lot of the stuff we talked about today was also based on business rules. So understanding the use case and how they want to do this stuff, uh, how they want to achieve the different business objectives is really important. It's really important to find that quarterback in, in the customers or you as a partner. Um, We've seen this to be a challenge with customers. So there's actually an opportunity from a partner perspective to actually be that quarterback, provide that overall, uh, I'll call it, you know, program management or overall view of how all the different pieces are gonna fit together. And then ultimately, we just talked about this today. The data strategy is really important. It helps drive a lot of the additional use cases that we're gonna talk about in the next uh, couple of days to make some of those things a lot more easier and streamlined. And with that, are there any other questions that you have that we can help answer in the next few minutes? Great. I think uh, for, for everyone that has, has had more questions and you put in your questions into, into GoToWebinar, I, will want to, I want to say that we are going to be covering all of this in the following webinar. So what I'd like to ask you is um, to tune in again next week when we continue the series. Before we wrap up, I would like to thank everyone again for taking the time to joining us today, especially me here for your awesome presentation today. Thank you very much. Um, 
Watch out for the recording, post your questions on the partner community or org 62 for our internal folks. And uh, I'd like to say take care and uh, see you next week. Thank you.